morning. And welcome to our the First Congregational Church of Boylston. To all those who are weary and in need of rest, you are welcome here. To all who are hurting and need comfort, you are welcome here. To all who are anxious and in need of peace, you are welcome here. To all who are broken and in need of wholeness, you are welcome here. To all the spiritually curious and searching for answers to life's biggest questions, you are welcome here. And to all those who need to hear the good news of what God has done through Jesus, you are welcome here. My name is Peter Haynes, and I am the worship leader today. If you are new to our church, thank you for being here. We are honored to have you with us, and we would love to get to know you better. You'll find welcome cards in the back of the pews in front of you. We would love to have you fill one in and place it in the offering plate in the front or the back of the sanctuary. The flowers on the altar this morning are given to the glory of God in loving memory of my husband, Ralph Mungin, by Dottie and family. Um, I have a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, we welcome all the church children today. today. It's so wonderful to have them worshiping with our, work, our church family. And next Sunday, we need at least three volunteers for coffee and community. There are plenty of open Sundays if you haven't already uh, signed up. And the kids have activity bags, so please have them rehang them at the end of the service downstairs on the hat rack. Please rise and join me for the call to worship. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. You may be seated. give you a little um, heads up on what Vacation Bible School was about this past summer. And we were on, as you can tell, a ship. And we went to an island where there were pirates. And they were really good pirates. And they, we were searching for the greatest treasure of all. And I'll tell you what that treasure is a little bit later on. But I want to see if the kids remember how we're going to warm up this morning. What are you going to say if I go, uh, I don't remember. Okay. So what are we all? We're all what? Blessed. Blessed. So let's sing it together. I want to hear your voices. Ready? And I'm going to ask them another question. If you were on a ship, what would Michael do? Michael would go inside. That's right. <laughs> so I'm going to sit down and let the kids sing this one to you. And we're going to use our hand motions. Are you ready? And I want to hear your voices, not mine. Ready? Michael rose above the storm. Why? 
locks might get in the way for this song. So if you want to take them off, you can. My head, my head just keeps falling. Yeah, they might fall off. So, so get out of here. if we were searching for the greatest treasure of all, that would be Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So let me ask the kids one more question. If you love Jesus and you know it, what do you do? Or, okay, so let's stand up. I think Charles is going to help us with this one, um, if you love him. So, I'm going to sit down again. Are you ready? I want to hear you, not me. Ready? If you love him and then you know it, clap your hands. If you love the men, you know it, clap your hands. If you love the men, you know it, then you really ought to show it. If you love the men, you know it, clap your hands. If you love the men, you know it, stomp your feet. If you love the men, you know it, stomp your feet. If you love the men, you know it, then you really ought to show it. If you love the men, you know it, stomp your feet. If you love the men, you know it, shout amen.
Well, good morning, church. So wonderful to see you all here this morning, whether you're here in person or you're with us online. We are honored and thankful that we can gather around the good news of what God has done for the world through Jesus. Of this good news that offers us forgiveness and wholeness, redemption, that we can be made new, set free, um, not only from our own sins, but free to, to truly love and worship in the midst of our broken world. If you're here this morning and you're not quite sure what you think about God or the Bible or Jesus, we want you to know that we are so glad and honored to have you here with us this morning. Um, we welcome you. Inevitably, though, through our singing, through our prayers, through our teaching, you'll hear things that you disagree with, and we want you to know that that is okay. Uh, we welcome your questions, we welcome your doubts, and we welcome you because we believe that Jesus with arms spread wide on a cross, is welcoming you to himself to find wholeness, to find rest, and to find ultimate salvation. In this next part of our worship gathering, this is something we do every week, um, and we think it is a pivotal in following the ways of Jesus. So in the biblical story, what we see is God is, is shown to us as being perfectly good and righteous. And when we look at how God sets a, a way of life for us to live, we see that we all fall short. We're greedy, we're selfish, but we are sinners. And so we come to this place of acknowledging that. And so if you feel comfortable, I do invite you to pray our prayer of confession with me this morning. You can find it in our worship guide. And let us pray. Jesus, we confess that we have sinned. We have gone. Lord, have mercy on us. Amen. But hear now the good news. Even though we are born sinners, we are born fatally flawed, we are born broken, and with that we fully participate in the brokenness of the world. And because of that, we are legitimately so, separated from a holy and righteous God. But God was not satisfied with this predicament. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whosoever would believe in him would never perish but have everlasting life. And we are told that when we believe this message, that Jesus lived the perfect life in our place, that Jesus died on the cross, taking away our guilt of sin, our shame of being sinned against, he dealt with it on the cross, and three days later he rose from the dead, defeating death, and tell and sin and all bad things, and whosoever believes this message is now and forever forgiven. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And as we prepare our hearts and minds for communion, I invite you to stand. We're going to sing a hymn. Let us break bread together. It's hymn 460, or the words will be on the screen.
be seated. Well, good morning. As many of you know, this is the first Sunday of the month, and it is the Sunday where we gather around the Lord's table and partake of Holy Communion. And communion is a gift, very and truly so, a gift of God for God's people. And it is at this table we come to for spiritual nourishment. We come to as a reminder that we need something that we cannot uh, construct. We need something that we can't just God's grace. And as we come to this table by faith, we're not only declaring our faith in Jesus, but we're declaring our trust in what Jesus did for us. And when we come to the table by faith, God meets us here. And so we call this a sacrament. A sacrament means a means of grace. And so we believe that when we come to the table by faith, God works through this means of grace differently than he works otherwise. In the same way, when we read the Bible, right, we, we say that's God's word. I, I open the Gospel of John and I read, in the beginning was the word. And I'm not only reading words of men, I'm, I'm reading the words of God. And God works distinctly in that act of faith. And the same is true as we come to the table. Many of you, even this week, have pretty rough weeks. Sickness in the family, job stuff, broken relationships. And we need something from outside of us to offer us wholeness. And God meets us here and he offers peace. He offers rest. He offers himself because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Now, when we come to the table, though, this is something that's for followers of the way of Jesus. And I know there are some of you in here this morning, and you would say, look, I'm not sure what I think about God or the Bible or Jesus. And as I said earlier, we are so glad and honored to have you here with us. And we would never ask you to go against your conscience. And so as we invite people forward to the table, please feel free to to sit in the pew, no one will think any less of you. We are very glad you're here. This is a, a meal of the four believers. And so here's how we'll do this in case you forgot from last month. We'll start in the back. And so if you're on this side of the sanctuary, so starting in the back in the balcony, if you guys want to come forward. And then when the, the pew behind you has gone, feel free to get in line. And you'll come forward, you'll, you'll grab a, a cup of juice and a piece of bread and take it back to your seat. We will take it all together. And then the same is true for this side. We'll start in the back and you will come forward and get the elements. And if you would like to participate in communion, but you would not like to walk forward for whatever reason, just uh, raise one of your hands and we've got a deacon here that will serve you the elements. You can walk just fine right now. <laughs> take it back to your seats and we'll all take it together so I just invite you now at this time to come forward and receive the elements of the supper
So we celebrate this meal because it is a meal that Jesus gave us to celebrate as we remember his sacrifice. And many of you will remember that this meal comes to us from a Jewish meal where the Jewish act of God saving his people, leading them through uh, the parting Red Sea, leading them to the promised land. And Jesus redefines this meal for us. And he says, this celebratory meal that we are about to partake in, let me tell you what it points to. Let me tell you what it's all about. And then Jesus begins to break bread. And he says, this, this bread that I'm breaking, it's not just bread to celebrate what God did back then. He said, it's my body, which is broken for you. Jesus takes on all of our sins and guilt and shame onto his body. He says, I'm dealing with this for you. The body of Christ, take and eat. And likewise, Jesus took this cup and he says, this, this glass of wine again that we drink in remembrance of what God did back then, let me tell you what it points to. And he says, this is my, my blood. It's a sign of a covenant. It's a sign of a promise that God is going to continually make things right and good and true and as they should be. That one day, Jesus, who not only died for our sins and rose from the dead, but we have this absurd claim as Christians that Jesus, the true king, is one day going to come back and make everything right. He's going to eradicate sin and brokenness and heal the world to right all Wrongs, And this is where we put our hope. And Jesus says that when he comes back, he'll again drink this cup with us. And until then, though, it reminds us of the promise that awaits. And Jesus said, this is my blood. Take, remember, I mean, take and drink. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these gifts. We thank you for the ultimate gift, the ultimate sacrifice of what you have done for us on the cross and raising from the dead. We thank you for this, not only message, but this event. And this morning, I pray that we would better what it means for us collectively and what it means for the world. I pray that we would grow in our understanding, that we would grow in our love for you, and that you would be with us uh, this morning. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
scripture reading today is taken from Jeremiah 29, verse 7, and Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. And work for peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. For us, welfare will determine your welfare. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. series we've been calling Journey With Us, and so that means this is the last one of the series. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Where we've been talking about kind of how we as a church, like our plan to help people go on the greatest journey of their life, uh, the journey of following Jesus and what that looks like, what it ought to look like. And before we get into our teaching this morning, I want to make you aware of just a couple of things. The first thing is, I know many of you, your favorite thing about church on Sunday mornings is coffee and community downstairs. It's okay. Look, we don't have to beat around the bush. And, like we know. We know. And it's wonderful. I'm glad that's one of your favorite things. And we announced this in the summer. And so some of you may not have picked up on how we are doing coffee and community at least until Christmas. Um, so last year, you'll re rotated between them and they would serve the food, bring the food, and do all that kind of stuff. And we found a few things. One, we, some of you love service <laughs> so much. And then you found yourself, though, on um, the schedule like three weeks in a row of a month, and you didn't love that. So that was one issue. And then in the summer, we kind of changed it up and just put a sign-up sheet and gave you the power. And we found a few things. We found that, and so we're trying that again at least until Christmas. And so as you're downstairs or you grab goodies, look at the calendar and then sign up for a spot. Two or three people, maybe four. It's up to you. Um, and so we would love for you to do that. Um, sign up with your friends many times as you want. There's no limit. <laughs> There's no limit. And the next thing I want to let you know real quick before we get into our teaching is uh, next week we're starting a brand new teaching that we're called, calling skeptical. And here's kind of the point of, the, of this. When we look out into our culture, into our world, there are questions asked about our faith. Um, is Christianity true is a question. But then also I think a more pervasive question, at least for kind of my generation, is not the truth claim, but is Christianity good? And so here's the, the series we're going to be doing, skeptical. Is Christianity good? And here's two goals with this series. One goal is this. If you're here this morning and you're not sure what you think about God, the Bible, or Jesus, come and engage in this conversation. But our primary goal is for those of you who are hopefully out in your workplace, your, your neighborhood, your, at family events, and you're having conversations with people whom you love, and they have these kinds of questions, we want to equip you to have good conversations about Jesus. Because at the end of the day, we want to help you. Here it is, right here. This is what we're talking about this morning, actually. Make a difference in the name of Jesus. And this is what we're talking about this morning for our kind of third step of this journey. And before we get there, I want you to hear St. Paul's words to the church at Ephesus. This is what Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's masters. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the things or do good things he planned for us long ago. Now think about this just for a moment. When Paul was writing this letter, he writes it to the saints at Ephesus. The, it's actually the word saints is the plural form of the word holy in Greek. So he's writing to the, the holies. Now what does that mean? Some of you are thinking like, well, that's not me. 
All that means, the saints, the holies, he's writing to people who are believers. It doesn't mean that if you're a Christian, you have it all together. If you're a Christian, it doesn't mean that you ought to be, nor can you be, perfect. But when we place our faith in Jesus, we are redefined on God's terms. And so we are sinners, yes, but at the same time, we are also, because of God's grace and the work of Jesus, we are called saints in God's economy. And so Paul is writing to the saints in Ephesus. He's writing to those people who believe the gospel and are gathering in Ephesus to do church. And he reminds them, we as Christians are God's masterpiece. I'm going to go back real quick. There we go. Got masterpiece. Now, masterpiece, this is a fun word. It's actually in the Greek. It's where we get our word poetry. I mean, think about that. And this is what St. Paul is telling us. We who place our faith in Christ, what is your identity? And identity is a big thing in our culture as well. Regardless of where you are politically, we're all told that we ought to construct our own identity, whatever that looks like. And as Christians, we're saying, oh, we don't have to do that. Like this is our identity is that we are rooted in the fact that we are God's masterpiece. We are God's poetry to the world. He has created us anew. Remember what we talked about last week. That God wants to transform us and make us new. We're created anew in Christ so we can do what? So we can, I'll go back. <laughs> so we can, say this with me, do. So we can do the what things? Good things he planned for us long ago. You are God's masterpiece, created anew, so you can yeah, not just go to church. And, and and we talked about last week, why going to church and worshiping, it's formative, it's so important, it's vital for your spiritual life. But that's not the, the sole purpose, the sole reason God has created us anew. God didn't just create us anew because he thought we were worthy of it. God didn't create us anew because we've got it all together. No, he created us anew because of his grace so we could actually do something in the world. You'll remember that in this series we've been focusing on what it looks like for us as a church to do what Jesus told us to do, which is this. Now it's the next one. There we go. Make disciples of Jesus. This is what we're called to do as a church. Jesus tells us the end goal of our lives, make disciples. This is our goal for ministry. Now, we've said in this series that that means we need to make sure we're offering people space to essentially do three things if we really want to take Jesus' word seriously. We need to offer people three things. These are the three things. To explore, a place to become, and a place to do. So week one, we, we want to give people a place to explore the claims of the gospel, explore Christianity. This is why we're hosting Alpha at the townhouse. So you can invite your friends and family members who want to do this, explore. It's kind of step one on becoming um, a, a disciple of Jesus. But also, we want people to become. We need to change the way we think. We're, we're offered a better narrative, and we find that as we gather to worship on Sunday mornings. We, we find that as we break off into smaller groups and study the Bible together and pray for each other and encourage one another. Like Those things are transformative, life-changing avenues for you, but also we want to create space so you can really do this, which is right here. Make a difference in the name of Jesus, because that's exactly what you were created for. And we've all asked ourselves that question, right? What on earth am I here for? What on earth am I in this situation for? What on earth am I still doing this dead-end job that I hate? What on earth am I whatever? You were created in Christ Jesus to do good things, to make a difference in the name of Jesus. Now, what exactly does that look like? There are all sorts of good things we can do. There's actually no shortage of good things that you can do. And so before, the, before we get bogged down in the details of what we could be doing, should be doing, I want us to see two overarching ideas 
are areas where we should be making a difference in the name of Jesus. Two areas that I think the Bible really commands us, shows us what it looks like. Two avenues to make a difference. We're going to be talking about building up the church and building up the community. And so first, we're talking about building up the church. And as Peter read for us earlier, again, this letter to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 4, 11 and 12. Now these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. So what are these gifts? Well, he tells us. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Now for our purposes this morning, when we read this, I want you just to kind of see church leadership. We're kind of in a, a different era than they were in the New Testament, so we don't really use words like apostles and prophets. We still use evangelists and pastors and teachers. But God gives the church gifts, the gift of church leadership. Now, what is church leadership supposed to be doing? Why is this a gift? I'm so glad you asked. St. Paul tells us in the next verse. Their responsibility is to what? Equip. Equip. You guys are such good readers. (laughs) Equip God's people to do his work. Some translations say to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Now, this may strike us as a bit odd in our church culture, right? Now, what would we expect Paul to say? Well, God gives the church gifts to do ministry. God gives the church, church leadership and pastors and teachers and evangelists to minister to me. Isn't that how we think? But what is Paul saying? And this kind of is an affront to us. Paul's saying that my job is not to be the primary minister. My job is to coach you to do ministry because you are God's masterpiece, his poieia, his poetry, created anew to do good things that he has for you to do. To do God's work and to what? Build up the church, which is the body of Christ. And so when we're talking about building up the church, we're not talking about keeping nice paint on a church building. We're not talking about, and those things are important, don't get me wrong. We're not talking about the church building. We're talking about the church, which is the people of God. Now, I don't know, if when I was in Sunday school, I was taught, I don't want to say heresy, but I was taught, maybe many of you will know this, right? Here is the church. Here's the steeple. Yep, open it up. And what do you see? All the people. But see, if we really took St. Paul's words seriously, we would say, here's the church building. Here's the steeple so you can recognize the church building. And when you open it up, you see the church. Because the church is the people of God who gather around and worship gather around the gospel, and then is sent out into the world. I know many of you grew up Catholic, and you're used to the word mass. Do you know what that word means in Latin? To be sent. And so the church does not exist to make sure a building is nice and neat and beautiful. And I think it's important, it should be, because it reflects But the church is a people who gathers to worship and then is sent out into the world to make a difference in the name of Jesus. We're supposed to help people understand, as far as church leadership goes, what your spiritual gift is. My job is to help you and our servant leaders is to help you understand how you can use your gifts and passions to build up our church here so we can collectively minister to our community well. Because we are the body of Christ. This is from Sunday school to music to serving tangible needs to welcoming people to serving food, which builds up the community, to serving at outreach events. Um, like I love that we have two people. Um, well, I'll just say their names because I'll brag on people. Uh, Lindsay and Ricky, who use their gifts of decorating at Alpha to make people feel welcome. 
Like, I've seen pictures of what the townhouse looks like after Lindsay and Ricky are done with it. And it's like, wow, this is a really nice space. Because I'm just going to be honest. Can I be honest with you? Is that allowed? Because when we're first talking about Alpha and reaching our community and that kind of stuff, and we're like, let's use the townhouse, and I go in, I'm like, oh, this is not going to work. <laughs> this is not going to work. But we have two people who are very gifted, Lindsay and Ricky, at making space feel welcome and look nice. And like that's not something we just say is irrelevant. It's helping us build up the church. And here's what I think. Every one of you has a gift that God has given you to help us minister effectively, not only to one another, but to our community and the world. The church is like an airplane. Have I said this before? No? You know what's fascinating about an airplane? If you take it apart, down to its smallest piece, there is not a single piece that makes up an airplane that can fly. Did you know that? I mean, it can fly as far as you can throw it, I guess. But there's not a single piece that on its own can fly. And yet, when you put all the pieces together, and all the pieces are operating the way they were designed to operate, it flies. I mean, this is like a, almost, I don't want to say magic, because I know there's engineering and science that makes it. But I mean, think about how heavy it is, and it can fly around the globe, and that's kind of how the church is. See, we all by ourselves, individually, can't really do a whole lot of anything. I mean, we can, but it only goes so far, as far as you can throw it across the room. But you see, when we all understand our gifts, the way God has designed us, the spiritual gift that God has given us, the passions that we have, and we come together as the church, the body of Christ, the physical representation of Jesus in Boylston, and we do our part, you see, we can do so much more. And it takes all of us doing our bit to build up the church, which is making a difference here. And so here's, here's my, my, my prayer for you, is that we want to help you find your place to make a difference here. And so we've been talking about how we can do this, and sometime in the spring we'll be having a, a teaching series on the spiritual gifts, what that looks like, what that means. And hopefully we'll do some work before that. But, you know, we've got boards and committees and teams, and we want to help you find your place. But also, we don't want to just build up the church. We also see this in the Bible. We're called to build up the community. The prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament. So this is before Jesus was born. And when Jeremiah was doing ministry, there's a lot going on in the land of Israel. God keeps sending his people prophets. Well, and Judah, God keeps, keeps sending his prophets, saying, hey, you're, you're not living God's way. You're worshiping other gods. Repent. And repentance, you'll remember, means to turn a 180, turning from the ways of the world, turning to the ways of God. Repent, or I'm going to have to bring judgment. They keep saying, no thanks, no thanks, no thanks. And so finally, judgment comes, and there's this great exile. And so Babylon comes in. And they destroy Judah and they take uh, God's people away to a foreign land. They're in exile. And look what God tells them to do, though. As they're in a faraway land where they're a, a cultural and religious minority. This is what God says. And work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. For its welfare will determine your welfare. What does that look like? Have you ever thought about how this is our Christian task? Our duty is following the ways of Jesus to seek the welfare of our community. To seek the welfare of our neighborhoods. To seek the peace and prosperity of where we are. Because I know we live in a post-Christian culture now, and sometimes we feel like exiles, and it's really easy to want to kind of hunker down and be our uh, kind of cultural minority with just us, where it's comfortable and safe, where we all, for the most part, agree on the big things and the things we disagree 
on. We at least know how to have conversations. And so it's, it's safe to set up kind of these monasteries, right? But the prophet Jeremiah says that's not what you do in exile. That's not what you do when you're a cultural minority. What you do is you seek the welfare of those who took you captive. Now, if we weren't taken captive, we're in our land of the free, our wonderful communities. Ought we not to still be doing the same thing? Seeking the peace and prosperity of where God has us. And here's what I think this means for us. It's really this. Our community should be better because we are here. Our community should be better because we are here. If our church ceased to exist tomorrow, would anyone in our community say, oh, that's a bummer? Or would they even notice? This is what Jeremiah is saying. The prophet Jeremiah, our God through the prophet Jeremiah, our community should be better because we are here. Like, it's why we um, have the food pantry, to serve tangible needs of others. It's why we got to serve uh, the greatest popcorn-only common yesterday at the fall festival. Yeah, there was other popcorn there. I don't know if you noticed. The ice cream truck was selling, and you know how many people I saw with that? None. You know why? Because we had the greatest popcorn on the common. I mean, that may sound like a silly thing. But what happens when we get out there and do just little things? Like, obviously, we want to do big things. We want to do Alpha and the food pantry. But it's also a lot of little things. Meeting our neighbors. Meeting people who are never going to step foot in here without an invitation. Meeting people who, over and over again, because here's the reality. Here's why these things are so important. One, because we do want to meet our neighbors and love our neighbors and seek the peace and prosperity of our community. But two, you all have lived life long enough to know that something at some point is going to happen. And, and people are going to be looking for answers and where are they going to look. You see, when, when people out there, out there, when something happens in their life and they start searching for where to find hope, and they start searching for where to find meaning, and when they start searching for how to find purpose, and they remember this community and all of the different interactions they've had. It may be the long game, but it's the game that God has given us to play. And we are called to make a difference by building up the church and building up our community. See, we have to get out there where people are and offer hope. We build up the church, the body of Christ, and we're ready to go out into the world and do the works of Christ. And may God bless the teaching of his word this morning. And before I um, pray for us, I invite you uh, to pray this prayer that Jesus gave us to pray. If you don't know the Lord's Prayer, it's in our worship guide. And so let us be so bold to pray the way Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. Father, we also come before you. We're so thankful that you care about all of our needs. Lord, and um, we know there are people here this morning who are hurting. And I pray that you would meet them in their hurt and you would offer healing, physically, spiritually, emotionally. We know that there are people here this morning who are anxious and depressed. And Lord, I pray that you would meet them in their anxiety and depression and give them peace. Lord, I pray that you would be with all of us, that you would give us a passion to use our gifts to build up your church. Lord, I pray that you would give us wisdom on how we ought to get out into our community to make the difference you've called us to make. Lord, we don't want to be a church that's just for us. We want to be a church that's for you and your work. That we would be used by you, as we sang earlier, to advance your kingdom here on earth. That as you build your kingdom, we would get on board with your work, not our own. 
that all of our little measly kingdoms would fall and that we would promote what will last forever, the eternal kingdom, your rule and reign in the hearts of men and women throughout the world, that we would do what you have called us to do, that you would fill us with your spirit to do so in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Before we um, sing the doxology, we don't have our generosity creed this morning, uh, but I do want to make you aware if you would like uh, to give. One of the things we do as we respond to God's generous love is we want to be a generous people, and we want to lead our hearts to generosity. We want to lead our hearts to the ways of Jesus, and Jesus says, right, we've talked about this before, how Jesus doesn't say that our wallets or Venmos or checkbooks that our heart does not follow those things. Wait, I said that wrong. It's been a long, long weekend. Jesus says, show me your treasure and I'll show you your heart. Jesus says that the way we lead our hearts is through where and how we give. And so as we lead our hearts to the way of Jesus, we want to be generous people. So you can do that online uh, at our website. You can do that in the front and back. This morning is also, as many of you know, the first Sunday of the month. Um, we also take up our deacon's offering, so you'll see the wooden offering plate in the front and the back as well. So if you would like to give above and beyond what you normally give, um, you can do so in that, and that is a fund that we use. So if someone in the community calls and they need help with um, groceries or electricity or something like that, or people in our own church community, that's where we draw out of. So if you would like to give to that, highly encourage you to do so. But I invite you to stand and let's sing the doxology this morning as we close. I do pray that God's favor would be on you, that his grace would go before you, and that as you go out into the world filled with God's presence, full of the Holy Spirit, you would be prepared to make a difference in the name of Jesus. So I do pray that God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would guard you and guide you and keep you until we gather to worship again. So in the name of Jesus, you are sent.